in today's world, especially the Western world, though people claim to be Christians, very few are actually practicing Christians. They are more impressed with science and technology, and most of them, practically, they are atheists. They do not believe in God. So how will you dawa to them? If I meet an atheist, and if he tells me that there is no God, the first thing I'll do is, I will congratulate him. You will wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I will congratulate an atheist is because most of the non-Muslims, they are non-Muslims because of the parents. Most of the human beings, they follow their parents blindly. He's a Christian, because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu, because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslim because their father is a Muslim. This atheist is thinking. His parents may be religious, but he's thinking. He does not agree in the gods which the parents worship. So, he says there's no God. And the reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. So half my job is done. The only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do, inshallah. See, the atheist, as I told you, Sulaiman Al Imran chapter 3 verse 64, is the master key for dawah. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bainakum. Come to common terms, I have been us and you. There are many Muslims who ask me that what is the commonality between the atheist and the Muslim? I said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha. There is no God. Because half my job is done. To another non-Muslim who believes in a God, first I have to prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong. And then I have to talk to him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said La ilaha, there is no God. Only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. Now most of these atheists, as I told you, they have become atheists because they believe in science and technology, which they feel is so advanced, and they become atheists. And after congratulating him, I asked him a question. That, suppose there is an equipment, there is an object, which no one in the world has ever seen, no human being has seen, if it is brought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, of this object. If I ask this question to an atheist, that an object or an equipment, which no human being has ever seen in this world, if it's brought in front of that atheist, and if he's asked the question, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, what reply can he give you? What reply can he give you? Creator, manufacturer, some may say creator, some may say manufacturer, some may say producer, some will say inventor, whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar, just keep it at the back of the mind. Either the atheist will tell you a creator, a manufacturer, a producer, an inventor, it will be somewhat similar, or maker, keep it at the back of the mind and continue. Ask him the next question. That how did this universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell you that we have come to know that initially our whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, and the earth on which we live. This they call as the big bang. If you ask the question to the atheist, when did you come to know about this big bang? He will tell you, 30 years back, 40 years back, we came to know how the universe came into existence in the big bang. You ask him the question. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. The heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist may say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue. You have to ask him the next question. That what is the shape of this earth on which we live? So he will tell you that previously 
the human beings, they believe that the earth was flat. It was in 1577, it's a Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You ask him the question, the Quran mentions the spherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, where Allah says, Wal ard And thereafter, we have made the earth X shape. The earth we live in is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical in shape. It is flattened from the poles. And the egg that is referred in the Quran, dahaha, one of its meanings is an expanse. One of the meanings is an egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine the Quran speaks about the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. You ask the question to the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell you, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad wasallam was an intelligent man. Don't argue, continue. You ask him the next question, that the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light of the sun. Yesterday in science means 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who has made the constellations in the skies and placed therein sun having a light of its own and moon having borrowed light, having reflected light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon was not its own light, but it was a reflected light, but it was a borrowed light? Again, the atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad was a very intelligent person. Don't argue with him. Continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. Is that what is mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. I learned in school that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the day and the night. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yes, bahun describes the motion of a moving body and it says that the sun, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. And today science tells us, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on the tabletop and the sun has got black spots and it takes approximately 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this? What I learned in school 23 years back, now the science says it is wrong. And the Quran has mentioned this 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The atheist may give a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, scientists tell us that our universe is expanding. The same message is given in the Quran 1400 years ago. In Surah Dhariyat. Chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space, the expanding universe. In the field of hydrology, it was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 who was the first person who described the present water cycle which we learn in school. Previously, we did not know about the water cycle. The first person was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 that he described that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, it moves to the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water table is replenished. Now this water cycle is described in the Quran in great detail in several places. In Surah Zumur chapter 39 verse 21, in Surah Rum chapter number 30 verse number 24, in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23 verse number 18, in Surah Hijar chapter number 15 verse 22, in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse 43, in Surah Rum chapter number 30 verse 48, in Surah Ra chapter number 13 verse number 17, in Surah Araf chapter number 7 verse number 57, in Surah Furqan chapter number 25 verse 48 to 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35 verse number 9, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50 verse number 9, in 11, in Surah Waqiyah chapter 56 verse 68 to 70, in Surah Mulk chapter 67 verse number 30, in Surah Tariq chapter number 86 verse number 11, 
you can keep on giving references only of water cycle mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. You can talk for several minutes on each verse talking about water cycle. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheists would be silent. Keep on. There are several scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. The Quran speaks about geology. Today science tells us that the mountains give stability to the earth. If the mountains were not there, the earth would shake. The Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, that we have created the earth as an expanse, while Jibala Autada and the mountains at stakes. Today science tells us that the portion of the mountain we see above the ground is a very small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. Like how when you put a tent peg in the ground, small portion remains on top, the major portion goes down. And these roots of the mountain, they give stability to the earth. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have created the mountain standing firm on the earth, lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, we knew previously that there were two types of water, salt and sweet. But we did not know that why these two water did not mix. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and the other salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier between them which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that though one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as barzakh, an unseen barrier, which science has discovered today. And Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنْ hai. We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed 1400 years ago that every living creature is made of water? Today, science has confirmed that everything is made from water. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, which we came to know recently. Quran says that every kind of fruits are created in pairs. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 3. In the field of zoology, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the animals. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bees. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69. Quran speaks about the spider. In Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 70 to 18. And all these aspects of the spider, of the ants, of the bees, we have come to know recently, and Quran mentions in detail 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this? Quran speaks about medicine, that in the honey there is healing for humankind. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 to 69. Quran speaks about the production of milk and the circulation of blood. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse 21, 1400 years ago, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about medicine, about physiology, about embryology. The various stages of the human development is described in detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. Quran speaks about genetics, about the sex responsible for the child in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4. After every scientific fact mentioned in the Quran, ask the atheists who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago. And his reply would be, the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. Even to an atheist, we can prove about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran. We are not using science to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science is the yardstick of the atheist. 
our yashtik is the Quran. We are using our yashtik and comparing with his yashtik and trying to prove that our yashtik, the glorious Quran, is far superior to your science. So these type of non-Muslims do dawa based on the similarities. If he thinks science is ultimate, we use science and try and get science and the commonalities in the Quran and try to get him closer to Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. We have to dawah with hikmah and with husna.